Uh, welcome to the first day of the Latinx Comics Art Festival and a special welcome to our panel, uh, Beyond Superheroes, Autobiography and Possibilities of Comic Storytelling. Joining us today are Jaime Crespo, Javier Cruz, Winnick, and Luke Martinez. Here we have a little round of applause. Thank you. Settle down, settle down. Hang on, the rowdy car guys. Hey, guys. That's enough for me. That's okay. <laughs> security. <laughs> so Javier Cruz Winnick uh, writes and illustrates his very own series titled A Reason to Smile about a little Puerto Rican girl from New York City who has a walking silver lining. He has created stories for Puerto Rico Strong and Reconstruction, which are anthologies helping to raise money for Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. He is a graduate graduate of Lynchburg College with a BA in Studio Art, where he earned an honorable mention and Best in Show awards. Uh, he took a year off to study at the Savannah College of Art and Design. He has funded multiple successful Kickstarter campaigns. Welcome, Javier. We also have, like I said, Jaime Crespo is a longtime published cartoonist during. Those 40 years, his, comic, uh, his comics appeared in several anthologies, including Monkey Wrench, Deadbeat Magazine, Buzzard, Blackwoods, White Buffalo Gazette, X-Ray Book, uh, Book Company, and Magazine, to just to name a few. His comic strip, Slice of Life, Literature into Slices, is uh, printed weekly in the papers. Oops, sorry. I am a little nervous. <laughs> uh, around the U.S. Um, upon the collapse of some weekly papers, he returned to self-publishing as an ongoing comic book titled Portilla, in which he has his, uh, he may tell stories, um, tell longer stories outside of the four-panel comic strip format. Currently, he is working on a much anticipated first graphic novel. Yes, Saints, the uh, Sinners and Saints. Uh, he, uh, which focuses on his time spent as a janitor slash maintenance man in San Francisco. Welcome, Mr. Crespo. Yay! <laughs> um, Luke Martinez is an adjunct professor of history at the College of the Sequoias, a high school teacher and a comic book creator who has produced graphic novels, short comics, and web comics. Uh, part of Ironclad Press. Welcome, Luke. All right, guys. I also got best in show, but it was at the Westminster. Oh, uh, West so. <laughs> Already with the jokes. I love it. <laughs> All right, guys. Honorable mention. Honorable mention. Love it. Uh, to begin, please tell us more about your work, specifically how you can utilize the autobiographical approach to storytelling. Were the autobiographical works by others? What were other autobiographical works that inspired you guys? We'll start with you, Mr. Winning. So the first one I had ever seen was actually one about the Pope. I don't know if you guys remember that comic from back in the 80s. Uh, there, was a, there was a comic about the Pope, and it looked like, it was, I think it was a Marvel book. Um, but it was about how this little boy was playing in, in this rectory area with his friends and kicked the soccer ball and went through the window and. And I was like, oh no, and they all ran away. And, but the one boy was like, I didn't. It was my fault, I had to own up to it. And you saw how all that played out. And it was the first time I ever saw like a comic being used to show somebody's real life. And I, I think that's probably what it was when I was doing uh, Puerto Rico Strong and Reconstruction. Um, they're both told from my experience in the world. Um, they also stem from the idea of, of using a reason to smile to create a, a narrative that, you know, we all go through different experiences, but we can all find a positive way to deal with those different experiences. So in doing that, as I write stories and, and, and um, illustrate stories for other people, I want to try to bring that into those spaces as well. Because we have enough stories where people punch each other in the face and have magical amulets and, you know, I mean, if that's part of your autobiography, that's that's pretty. That's a that's a whole other life. I mean, I have that as part of my story too. But we'll talk about that later. Um, but I, mean, we, we, I want to be able to show the other side of life because a lot of the other stuff is already out there. So 
And so, you know, people are also better producing those stories than I am. So let them tell those stories. Let them, let them create that, that space. You know, I'll take up the space over here while y'all over there. Mr. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> just considering what you were just saying. Mm -hmm. well, how, how did I start with the question or, or first begin? Yeah, yeah, tell us more about your stories and uh, how, what was the influences on um, focusing on autobiographical work? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess the influences were the underground comics of the 1960s and 70s. Uh, more of the, I guess you'd say the hippie uh, stuff. I, I, as like any kid, I watched cartoons, read the funny papers on Sundays. For, for those who are a funny paper person. Anyway, <laughs> you know, peanuts and all that kind of stuff. And then um, I saw a hippie newspaper where they had a curse word in it, and these mm. characters in there, and I thought, oh, my goodness. You know, mm -hmm. and I, I was I was on my way. Uh, I think I started just doing autobiographical comics without realizing that I wasn't doing them to, like, get published. I wasn't, I was just doing them to do it. It's just like, maybe it was cathartic. I don't know. And it wasn't until... Probably the early '80s that I was uh, became aware of Harvey Peacock, who ended up becoming a dear friend of mine and also a mentor. So um, I, I kind of went from there, and I just like telling stories. Sometimes I'm involved, sometimes I'm not. But you know, there's so much going on in life. Period. I mean, you don't need guys flying in their underwear with amulets and, and things, which is fine. It's um, it's just it's a funny medium. I, I music. If I want to put a musical genre, I look at. Uh, superhero comics on it was kind of like you know the mainstream music like you know it's like Prince though it's good as a Prince uh, Michael Jackson name who you want as a big one but like what I'm doing I feel like <laughs> I'm like the Eric Dolphy or John Coltrane I'm the jazz like you know it's kind of the forget about it section that you know not a lot of people listen to but it is American made it is you know it's there it's, it's around maybe you know somebody gets hit to it some people don't Ooh. <laughs> oh, yes, I to be the top layer of, of the top of American music. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Bob Newhart. The Bob Newhart. <laughs> uh, Milo Smuzak. Um, so I, so it, it, for me, I think what I realized is when I was younger and I was just reading comics or even reading like comic strips, like one of the earlier panels we talked about Calvin and Hobbes, yeah. like it occurred to me that, that Bill Watterson was talking a little bit about himself. You know, and I didn't realize that there's no there's no way to write a story that doesn't include autobiography. You just can't do it. You're going to bleed into the into what's being done. It's just how overt you want to be about it and what you want to do with it. So, um, and totally blowing up the premise of the panel, the first autobiography thing I did was actually a superhero story, <laughs> but because it was actually using superheroes as a way to talk about like generations mentoring others, and I wrote the ascendant. And so like I was talking about my grandpa actually relating to me and then using superheroes, although not in the normal way, but since then I've realized that everything you write is gonna pull that in. So I was working on a science fiction story um, about a character who, you know, doesn't feel like she fits into either world. Um, I also actually finally said I need to write something to talk about like my grandma. So I wrote this short comic called Abuelita and it's about me trying to explain to my white friend what Mexican food is and how it gets made, but I can, so I have to use magic real mm. So, so for me, it's one of these things that um, you could be overt about it or not. But even if you, you know, if anyone up here, if we just said write a book or a comic about anything, that you're going to come into it through your experiences and what you see. I realize that like everything I write ends up with a strong female character that tells the main character what to do, and I'm like, it's either my wife or my mom. I don't know. <laughs> 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 I love it. I love it. Oh my gosh, that sounds so amazing. I love that there's such a strong focus on representation in your body of work. I love that uh, Olympia title. Love it. Um, as a Latinx creator, do you find that you uh, feel the responsibility to your uh, respective communities to represent them? What are some of the, the cultural considerations that are reflected in your work? We will start with Javier. Oh yeah. No, there's no question. Yes. There's no yeah. question. Unequivocally. Yes. And it's like, I, I talk about it all the time in everything that I do. So it's like, if I'm going to be doing comments, it's, it's going to absolutely be a part of that as well. Um, I was speaking to David earlier. Um, to give a shout out. He, uh, he was talking about how he, he does Aztec art. And I, I, I was telling him how jealous I was of that. Because as a Puerto Rican person, there's a lot that is missing from our culture. 
because of the colonialism, because of the, um, in all aspects of it, yeah, taken, destroyed. Um, so it's like trying to re-earth that, going to villages that are preserved on the, on the island and talking to elders and trying to put it into the works because had I not done my own series, I wouldn't know who Atabe is. I wouldn't know where we're next. I wouldn't know Huracan. I wouldn't know these, these deities on top of, you know, the semi and what the petroglyphs were about. I have no connection to that. Just because of the way I was raised, the way that the people in my community didn't even talk about it. You know, America has done such a good job of um, keeping doors closed that I want to open those doors. That's amazing. Is it yeah, I, I mean, I'm aware of it, you know, but it, it doesn't matter. Whatever I create, it's my perspective. Mm -hmm. And so, by by and large, that's what it is. It is a lucky perspective, right? And it's going to be also one more division of my, you know, perspective, or my family, our culture, our subcultura, if you will, just underneath that. So, and I, I'm aware of it, but, you know, I, I, I hope... You know that some people that say aren't within the culture can pick up things too, because at the end of the day, you know, as I, said, I used to draw a lot, of, I used to have a comic, I used to. Uh, everybody was a, a, a calavera, everybody was a skeleton in it, because you know when we all die. That's what we all underneath. You know, the men, the women, the gay, the whatever, the black, the brown, blue, we're all skeletons at the end. So at the end of life, you know, it's we're all people, we're not different species. So, well, he's gonna get it sooner, but you know. But yes, yes, so I guess that was a long way of saying. It. Yes. yes. <laughs> or wait, C. C. <laughs> Mr. Martinez? So I, I actually would tell this in two different stories. Uh, the first is when I was a kid, uh, so my, my dad's Mexican and my mom's white, and uh, my my dad had this chess set when my when my grandpa Martinez had gone he had gone to Mexico to help out with some stuff. And he bought this chess set and it's it's looks like it's made out of jade and stone. It's like an Aztec looking chess set, right? Mm. It's a chess board, it opens, but it's made out of like it's I'm sure it's not real jade, but they, you know, it, it's built like that. All the figures are like Aztec nobility. I'll do that again. And I saw this thing, and I'd see it sitting there, and I'd always have my dad get it out, look at it, and I was just like, this thing is so cool. <clears throat> Meanwhile, I, you know, I, that's what I'm thinking at home, and I'm, I'm hearing something. Then I go to school looking like Opie, and people are like, this doesn't belong to you. And I'm like, that's that's not fair, right? And I, yeah. remember, I remember other kids, too, like saying that I wasn't allowed to participate in certain things because I wasn't Mexican enough. And I'm like, well, where are your grandparents from? And they're like, Fresno. And I'm like, well, mine look born in Mexico. Like, don't I get past past that? Like, right. I got closer degrees than you guys just because I don't have the tan, right? And right. and I remember feeling kind of left out by that. So I felt for a long time very afraid to speak on that. But now I realize that, like, like I'm going to say, I can't just say, I can't just say speak on everyone's experience, but I can speak on mine. And to get, kind of connect with people on that. So I mean, that's something too. As I got older, when I went into like academic history, and we start talking about certain things that are universal. I mean, I still like the whole idea of you know the Rasa Cosmica is a big deal to me. The idea that we all there's some things that are shared. But I think the other thing that opened my mind up too is going up to a community where every person who's Latino is Mexican. When I started meeting Puerto Ricans and Cubans and people from Nicaragua, and I'm like. What's going on? You know, there's a little bit of disorientation. Like, I, I moved to Pittsburgh, and one of the professors was Cuban, and he was like, you know, he's like, well, yeah, everyone up here, we're all just Mexicans up here, but until you meet each other, you know, and then I was like, and then I started seeing all these different insights and understanding different things. And so, even having this thing of like, like Latina not speaking to itself and to each other was really powerful. So, I guess for me, I don't, I never would ever say that I, have a duty to speak anything because I write stuff that's sometimes really personal, sometimes it's not. Um, but I think that, like the others, I can't not bring it in. Like, how could we? How would you cut it out? Yeah. I can't make it. I mean, it's, I end up with a lot of characters from between two worlds or who look different than what they are. So that's. I don't think that was an accident. But. And that also brings up an idea to me too. I look forward to the day where I feel like I don't have to anymore. Right. Because I feel like there's not enough. If I don't do it, who's gonna do it? Right. You know what I mean? And I don't know anybody. I only know one other creator that does it. Well, and he didn't do it when I was doing it. Yeah, but it's almost a trap in both directions because it's like if you produce something 
that is too overtly mm -hmm. Latin. It's pigeonholed. Cool. But if you but if you produce something that isn't Latin enough, it's no good. Yeah. So it's like I when I did the ascendant, I the character is main two characters are white and black, but the next character is Mexican. And one of them asked me like, why that I said, Well, I wanted to hear a little bit of my dad. My dad was my hero, like I wanted a brown guy in there too. But I could make him the main character because then it becomes about being Latin, right? Mm -hmm. It becomes about that. And it's it just the way that, that gets starts drawing everything in all the time. And then I actually make something that's really heavily freighted with like with really the Chicano identity, and nobody wanted to publish it. So I'm like, which, but what do you do here, you know? Oh, wow, that's really deep. I didn't even realize that you guys go through that as creators. It's incredible. Um, are there any challenges that you found writing from an autobiographical standpoint uh, that you may have avoided in writing uh, the traditional fiction? Oh, well, we'll start with you. I can get up again. Um, it's hard because you don't you don't want to put yourself out there, and then people don't take to it. So it's like, is this what I should do? Is are people going to gravitate towards this? Are they going to connect to this somehow? That's the challenge. So I, I like to take long time. So in, in trying to write in that way, what I try to do is see how whatever I'm experiencing is something that someone else is going to go, either going to go through or has gone through and then connect my experience to theirs. So it's not just me in my own vacuum and me in my own space, but it's me and you and them and us going through the situation together. Right, right. Mr. Crespo? Yeah, my, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, I summarized out um, because most of my work is it's uh, you know autobiographical stuff. I, I involve a lot of other people and it's kind of two full stuff. There's still things. I did a story. <laughs> I won't get into it. But I did. I did a story about Jesus, the teenage years. Mm. You know, okay. and, and, and I waited. I wrote this. I don't know, like 25 years ago. Yeah, I even did the first panel with you know. What would you do if I sang out a tune? I had him like the Wonder Years, and I had Jesus with his tunic and had Charlie Brown and you know a teenage mustache and and doing teenage stuff. And I waited twenty some years after my mother died before I did that. Wow. That's how you know. So it can get like that. And then the other stuff when I had the comic strips in the weeklies, ninety five percent were about other people. I had six panels, and I went down four panels to tell a story of these people that I met through life and, and their trials or tribulations or joys or, or ironies and, and you had to really think about like I, I, I made it a point every single person either changed their gender their ethnicity and always used a different name so that was always kind of I don't want to get sued man I don't have anything you know so it, it's and I didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings but I want to tell the story you know so yeah there's, there's there are times you know doing that Fiction, not so much. Fiction's fiction. You know, yeah. the sky's the limit. You can write about whatever. You know? But uh, yeah, the personal stuff. I mean, like, there's still stuff I don't know if I'll ever do. I don't know. If there's, you know it's so much pretty hard. Yeah. That's awesome. I think it's awesome because you have so many stories within you still, which I think is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's like it's universal amongst you know, all the creators I've talked to is you have more ideas than you have time. And yeah. Always. Always. That's how you know if you're one of those people like, man, I have so many ideas for stories. Okay, you should be writing them down because that means you're someone who's great. Whether you like it, whether you believe it or not. Uh, I know for me with autobiography, one of the hard things is that you're worried about, I mean, rejection feels very personal, right? Yes. You put something oh, yes. out there, and if nobody gets it, then you're like, oh, so it was just me feeling this thing. <laughs> you know, right, then right. it feels very isolating. I think there is a thing I'm saying about like your mom. Like you got to be kind of careful about right. what it's going to create. Right. Um, I know that there's there's people who've gone through these kind of things that, that, that you put something out there and people are like, well, that's actually about me. I just thought I read a thing not long about Jerry Seinfeld when he did the show. The character George Costanza is is not based off a friend of his, but he used his friend's name. And the friend was super upset. Oh, wow. And well, obviously because you know that that character. So I'm like, so I don't know. So I mean, part of it you don't want to put too too many things right on the nose, you don't right. want to necessarily say that. But I think the other, I think another limitation is, is that you have, like autobiography at some level takes a real sense of authenticity with yourself. Can you be honest about who, what you really think or feel right. about it? Right, right, yeah. Well, you, you definitely can, call on it. 
Right. Well, you put all that time. What are you talking about? Right, right, exactly. And doing, I, mean, we, I don't think we realize we spend so much time policing ourselves True. that to really be able to produce something, you got to stop for a second. Yeah. That's a, wow, I'm learning so much. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. Um, how would you suggest new creators who are interested in the autobiographical genre begin their process? What are some of the tips you can give creators? I think I think you hit the nail on the nose and being honest about yourself. Really it's introspecting and taking the time to really know who you are, why you do what you do, why you've done what you've done, what you're gonna do. And then you know, you gotta treat yourself like a character in your own story and say, Okay, I gotta know myself so well that I know whenever I write this and then this way will come about how would I respond to that as a character in the story? And if you can be honest about that, then you're gonna be able to write a better story. Yeah. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I agree, it does start yeah, with, with being honest with yourself. And um, paying attention, just paying attention and listening. There's, you know, because a lot of your stories involved with other people that are part of the story, and I guess the details. I, I, I've been, I've been on a handful. This isn't my first rodeo by any stretch, and uh, I, I've told some kids that come later. I said, you know, it's the stuff that isn't necessarily in front of you. It, a lot of stuff is on the periphery. You know, when you have a tendency of getting really just like myopic, mono vision, but you know, just kind of get your head on a swivel, open your ears, and just pay attention. Out a bit, and you know, and kind of take mental notes or however you want to, and it will come. And then, along with, with you know, what Javier said about you know, being honest with yourself, with the story, with the aim of the story, what you want to convey with the story, you know, and, and, and having, you know, well, I, mean, I think one of the reasons I'm, I like to create stuff is I find people fascinating. Like, I'll go to like things with my my wife was saying, we'll be at a cocktail party or a board event, and I'll start talking to somebody, and I, she's like, you know, you're probably getting too personal with this thing, because I want to know things about you, find out you meet right. people, you find out there's so much more going on, right. and I think that that's what you, one way you have to do it, when you go to you have to realize to somebody else, your story is like that. I always think there's a famous speech by David Foster Wallace, where he's talking about, it's called This Is Water, there's these two fish swimming, and an older fish comes along and goes, hey boys, how's the water? And they go, what the hell is water? <laughs> and he's saying, because when you're in something, it doesn't appear to you to be different or to be the medium. It's just where you are. This is why most people who produce autobiographical stuff produce stuff they've left, because you, when you're in it, you don't think about it. Right. Um, but I think that the, the most important thing is you have to produce it for yourself because of that part of it. If you put it out hoping that you're going to get rich or famous, a lot of people are going to read it. I mean, nobody has control over that. But if you put it out because it's a story you have to tell, it'll be good. And even if only one or two people were to ever read it, but if they really enjoyed it and you made a connection with the person, I think that's worthwhile. Well, that, that's the whole premise. If somebody in Oxblood, Tennessee is mm-hmm. like, dude, I, you know, have da da da, you, you won. Yeah. That's it, right? There. I literally, I, I go on Instagram once a year. I never, <laughs> I almost never do. And I had a message sitting there from a person who wasn't my friend for over a year. <laughs> And he had bought my comic and read it and really had been affected by it and wanted to tell me. And I was like, it, to me, that was way cooler than anything else I've got. Because we made, we made some, uh, you guys reviewed that the comics. That connection, too. yes. You guys reviewed the comics, I've like, the comics, and I actually listened to it on the ride and hearing you guys talk about it. Like, okay, cool, something I was saying resonated with you guys. Uh, well, I think you gave it a better rating than Jen did, and I think that's because you're, <laughs> yeah, you think you're better than her. Um, <laughs> The, I think the other thing too is I think the hardest the thing with autobiography is our lives are so huge yeah. that sometimes it is just to slice the piece out that can be a story. And that's like the hardest thing. It's like sculpting. Like Michelangelo always said, he always saw the forms. He just had to free them. Mm-hmm. So I mean, so you got to figure out what part of your life can be turned into a story. And some things you don't know that you're still in the midst of it <laughs> until you get out of it's it. Open. Yeah. It's quite a it can't be, but I mean, I'm sitting here and I'm looking at just the people here, and I'm like, with the, the conversation you guys were having about skating when we came in, right, right, right. like, we could tell a really cool story just about a connection between people to that one thing, right. and I could tell a million stories, but but we don't know which one's going to be the way in, so I think I think that it comes back to the thing I tell everybody who comes to this especially, is if you want to make that story, you got to make it, 
And whatever you want to do, if it's going to be a short film or art or comic or a book or whatever, the only thing to do is to do. Not to be too Yoda about it. I know. Right? Like, it's like, <laughs> like the only thing you have to do is is do it because your story's in there somewhere, and then usually in the process of fighting with it, something comes out. Like you're kind of you're panning for gold, right? Something will come loose. It may not be the thing. I, I agree with Jaime. It's that it might be that thing that you didn't think about over here, right. but suddenly you're like, oh, that was a much bigger deal than I realized. Mm. There's also an idea of like the, the director's cut, right? You have the story that you made, yeah. but then like it gets whittled down into this other little story. Yeah. Sometimes you got to cut the, the, the fat off. Well, yeah, and we don't really experience time. I mean, we experience time literally, but in linear forms. But we don't necessarily have memories that way. So you might also have to think you're going to tell the story differently. I I, uh, I have to tell people like I, I have a cousin who was gay, and growing up, him and his his boyfriend regular, his husband. I when I was a kid, we, we didn't talk about it. We just knew he he was always. Russ is always with Bob, and I was like, man, he always has a best friend around, that's awesome. I hope I have a best friend around all the time. I had no clue, and then when I got older, somebody told me, and I was like, oh, right? And, oh, and I was telling, it, 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 it all fit, right? Because it all made sense, and I was like, oh. And But if I told that story directly in order, it probably wouldn't be as good. But if I just skipped from those two points to like, this happened, and this happened, and then what I've realized since then, do things. So I think getting away, realizing that we don't experience or remember remember things in linear time. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, so as you guys know, on our podcast, Comales Comics, we have a segment called Puntos y Fuertes, where we celebrate creators, projects, highlighting members of the marginalized communities. Uh, would you like to share any creators or projects that you think that the audience may want to know about? <laughs> Have you heard of Reconstruction? <laughs> oh my god, you guys! Such a great book. I feel like we gotta chat each other up first. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess uh, so. I was a part of Reconstruction, I was a part of Puerto Rico Strong, two stories that were trying to help Puerto Rico with uh, what happened with Hurricane Maria. Um, I have a new story that's out that's actually, I feel so confident about my, my series that I actually did a spin off. And, um, started a reason, another reason to smile, which is the title of it, that did well on Kickstarter. Um, so I have that coming out next month. And then that's gonna be a serial that I'll do that I'll collect that and then have a, a whole nother trade that I'll be able to sell and you know, have people enjoy. Cool. Yeah. What about you, Mr. Kinesco? Yeah, I wish you did a right. So I'm kind of sitting there going, yes. Yeah, yeah. So we wanna know what books you're doing. What are yeah. you doing, man? Well, well, the books, first of all, I think anything Carlos Saldana does, Burrito, Jack of All Trades, is one of the most underrated comic books. It's been around for 30, 40 years. I came around with Carlos forever. Buy it. It's, it's, he's incredible. It's, it's good for kids. Anybody can read, but everybody will get a laugh out. It's not just a children's comic book. Burrito, Jack of All Trades. I think that's something worth uh, uh, looking at. Uh, what I'm working on now is just my comic books are here, which are all auto-bio stuff, but I, I'm now in the home stretch of the much anticipated, because it's taken eight years so far, of my, because I lost it at one point, my graphic novel, I used to live in the Tenderloin in San Francisco in the 1980s, mid-1980s, a janitor maintenance man, and um, it's called Sinners and Saints, and it's about all the people, I had a comic strip called Tales from the Edge of Hell, and this is a fleshed out version of that, of all the characters that live in the building, live in the community, and this is not for kids. It was, uh, and you know, and it was written so long ago and lived even longer before. I'm kind of worried about being canceled because I'm keeping all the language in and and the cultural, the way people behave, you know, and, and back then and how they communicated amongst each other and how this whole culture went. So that's coming out. I've got a publisher for it and everything. So that's going to be happy. And finally. <laughs> Uh, the TV show on Hulu, Woke, Keith Knight. I love that book. I yeah. mean, that, that show. That Sorry. show, yeah, okay. yeah. My buddy Keith, I did a bunch of artwork for this ep for this season. Oh, really? So it's oh, be my God, that's too. amazing. Yeah, I'm the kind of guy, man, if I win an award, I forget. So people always say, hey, I heard you won the pill. It's like, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's great. So let's get those tires on your car, huh? You know, so I'm like one of those guys. So, but yeah, yeah. But I'm mostly, I'm pleased for Keith, man. So, yeah, he, we've been friends for... Oh, far too long. But uh, I'm a great guy. So woke on Hulu, and I think it starts April, the second season, April sixth or eighth, right now. Oh, awesome! Because I was wondering if they would got picked up for a second oh, yeah. season. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's already done. It's already done. So. Yeah, I streamed that first season like 
just went right through it. It was really yeah, good, really good. I mentioned it on the podcast as well because I really, really liked it. And, and his comics now are knowing great. that you did the artwork, I was like, wow, that's like good. Like it's some, yeah, it's yeah. This is Phil and Talon. Mr. Martinez? Uh, I mean, I, I, I know he's not like a small, like, hard to hear anymore, but I, the Lalo Alcaraz, Lalo, uh, oh, Lalo yes. does so much cool stuff. It's like a couple years ago, yeah? Yeah, 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 a couple yeah. years he was here. I bought a thing from him that he had a, a history of the United States, and it's, yeah. a, it's a little cardboard pulled out, and it's just like, like four things of messed up stuff. Yeah. There. And I took it back to my students, so I teach history. I mean, 95% of my students are Mexican, so like, I was like, hey guys, check this out. And they're like, ah, oh, they're dairy owners. I'm like, Anyway, uh, the the big thing is that I I mean I think that he's like a, one of those voices that's just so like, prophetic. I would say like, he's seeing stuff. Uh, lately, I feel like I have a hard time putting my finger on anything specific, like any specific people. But I know lately, I feel like I've been seeing more stuff produced by like trans artists and stuff oh, because, yes. because it's a it's an experience that that I don't know, but that I want to understand or to at least be able to sympathize with or perceive properly. And it's you know uh, I find a lot of times it challenges me in ways that are really uh, unexpected, but yeah. I still want to I still want to hear about it. Um, I think you know I think pretty much I think the big thing is and I like I'm. I'm a big comic dork. I go to the shops and buy Marvel and DC stuff, but I think that really? the, I do. <laughs> but <laughs> I do. At least I'm like, really? <laughs> I'm just a walking billboard. Um, I do think, though, that the best way to find out the coming voices is to go through the internet, is to go to small press shows and things like that, because that's a much bigger... You're more likely to run into those voices. The reason those voices are underrepresented is because those companies underrepresent them, so you're not going to see it until you get to the people who are producing it. But the cool thing is with Kickstarter and with social media, web comics, things like that, there's so much going on. So, yep. Yep. And for the, uh, uh, I think they're called uh, La- Lana House, Lana House, Lana House, Lana House, Lana House, Lana Brina, Brina Brina Nunez, Nunez and Lawrence Lindell. Oh, yeah. So look up their stuff, they're, yeah. they're really good. They're, they're, they're really here too. Right, yeah, right, and they put out, uh, uh, which I was honored to do the cover, and they put a story in it on, um, it's called The Baileys, and it's uh, a magazine that Lawrence is pretty much heading up that's in the Bay Area, all Bay Area cartoonists, uh, uh, queer and cartoonists of color, so it, it's really, it's, it's quite an undertaking, I mean, so they're, they're really something to watch, they're really taking half and half, you know that? Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah, because yeah, that was yeah. really super cool, but yeah. yeah. Comic goes in two different directions, telling a story right. of needs. Now it's like emerges. Yeah. And my brain is yeah. like, what? Why? Yeah, and they're married too, so it's like, yeah, they're all in. Oh, it's cool. it's all in. No, I'm a big fan of their work too, so yeah. it's really yeah. amazing. Uh, we also have a segment on our podcast called Chisme de la Semana. Uh, <laughs> is there any chisme of upcoming projects you're working on? Maybe something like, I mean, some really juicy chisme? No, no, it's cheese man. No, we're always looking for some cheese man. I'll tell you some things I saw written about Honey Crespo in the bathroom. Oh, I mean, it's over there. Go to my bathroom. It's all true. I mean, he used to be a janitor. Muy caliente. I'll say that. Like what we're producing, yes. and I, I have a thing that I that I pitched like, called Daughter of the Underworld, which is about it's it's Aztec oriented space fantasy. Um, it's built in that kind of thing, but it doesn't include like an autobiographical thing. Um, I worked on it with Scenes, my editor, who was like a super brilliant cartoonist, and I thought it was cool too. So it's uh, there cool. you go. But I but I actually you know I'm still trying to figure out how to get it out there and get the right artist. Um, I'm also working on stuff on trying to tell some stories with people from other uh, Latin American countries. So I just finished a story with a guy from Chile, and I'm trying to get some other ones done. The idea of trying to bridge this thing of like, well, how are we thinking and how are they thinking, and what do we have in common, and one thing we have in common is common. Right. So, oh, that's awesome. I don't know how long it'll take, but <laughs> I'm trying. I do have okay. my next my next graphic novel after this was done, which I'm almost done with. Which you'll be interested. Well, both of you guys, right? It's it's tentatively titled called Passing, and it's it's about oh, wow. growing up being mixed or, or looking well or not. You know, 
in certain cultures and how you know we were interpreted. Lalo and I actually had a conversation. We first met back in the old. I've known him even longer than he. And uh, yeah, just about being almost like a fly on the wall with certain things and, and how you're treated by certain groups, your own group, other groups, and, and that, the whole nine. So that's that's going to be a smaller one. That's the next time. Yeah, I mean, we've heard stories of like, you know, people who don't speak Spanish because right. their family didn't teach them. And then other people are like, well, you're not black enough. You, right. you know, you don't even right. speak Spanish. You know, that, and then that puts you down and it messes with your identity. It's really, really, really tough. So that's funny. That part of me gets funnier too because I always tell my students when they go, like my students who've never been to Mexico, they're like, oh, I want to visit my grandma from going to Mexico. I know and I'm like, and I said, guess what? You're not a Mexican. I'm like, what? And you're about to find out. You're going to find out. Yes. Like, you're going to go to Mexico yes. and they're going to tell you you're an American. And you're going to be like, what? The Americans Insulted. call me a Mexican. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, because everyone sees you different depending right. right. on where you go. Yeah, because yeah, you're always from Alabama. You're from the other side. Yeah. It's the first time when I went down when I was 12. My mother was a Yaqui, so a lot of the old ones didn't even speak Spanish. Which sucked when I went down there because you know nobody spoke English or Spanish, so I don't speak Yaqui. But I'll tell you, this is the first time I ever heard the word bocho. Oh, yeah, <laughs> oh my. But I was not down the there. Last. Yeah. yeah, and not the last time. By the way, I used to work on Bocho magazine with Lalo and Esteban back in the, yeah. back in the day. Nice. So yeah, I remember being called a Yankee when I was in Puerto Rico once. I was like, I know Yankee. I know Yankee. I know Yankee. You're like a uh, little dino, bad young Yankee. No, no, it's it's very true. Like when I was, uh, I think I was 13, and I was going up and down school here, like, I'm Mexican, I'm Mexican. Well, lo and behold, went to Mexico, Mexico City in Puebla, and you're like, they're like, no, you're not Mexican. No, you're not. You are not Mexican. And that's when I realized, ni de aquí, ni de allá. Not here, not over there. So it was just like a really, it really messed with my identity for a while. And then it led to me trying to reject my my uh, culture for a moment in my life. And it just, it was really complicated. But you know, it really makes the, the term Chicano or Chicana even more important. What brother you say, because you're walking between up here, you know, you're not, you know, being or whatever, you know. Then you go down there, it's like, ha, <laughs> ha, You know, because, yeah, you got it all, right? You got Las Posadas and quinceañeras, but then you listen to the Beatles and you skateboard and you do, you got all of the, the cultures mixed up, hybriding into another one. Yes. So there you go. Yeah. And you know what the funny thing, I'm going to share a little story. I actually just uh, came back from Puerto Rico in January, I went, and all the Puerto Ricanos that I met there, they, they're like, oh, you're, you're, where are you from? And I said, oh, well, I come from LA, California. And they're like, but you're Mexican, right? And I'm like, yes. And then everybody started calling me La Mexicana, La Mexicana. And I uh, loved it. I was like in heaven. They're like, come here, La Mexicana. And I'm like, oh, me. yes. I got, <laughs> I got a quick story about about Latino ignorance. <laughs> now, I, when we were kids, we lived, I lived in Sacramento, and my mom and I moved. Hold on, hold on, I'm sorry, I gotta stop. Colonial ignorance. Okay, colonial. Well, no, but this you're gonna figure. What, you're gonna hear this one. This one's because this is me being ignorant. So we, we go from from Sacramento, mind you, probably next to Dave. I guess we're probably the two oldest guys in the room. So this is the 1960s. We moved to the Mission District in, in, in San Francisco, San Pancho, right? And you know, I'm thinking, yeah, everybody's. You know, Mexican here. And so my best friend, Ernie Ochoa, the kid I meet across the street, right? We're fast friends. We're in the, you know, monster movies. And, you know, we're just good buddies. And then um, he was born in San Francisco, born and raised, but his parents, so I thought, like, man, their Spanish sounds kind of weird. And he goes, oh, yeah, well, they're from Nicaragua. And I was like, wow, what part of Mexico is that? You know? Because, you know, at that point, you know, and you saw Ricky Ricardo, right, on TV, and then Chico and the Man, as a, that's about it in California, you know? But I like, just oh, there's other, you know? So that's what I meant, like, you know, ignorance. So I was like, I didn't there's, know. You know. There's layers to that, there's layers yeah. to that, too, because, I mean, I've never, I've never in person had someone mistake me for being Mexican, and I've never been like, oh, Mr. Martinez, and I stand up, and you see it kind of like, oh, shit. <laughs> and then I was on I was on the internet once and I bought something from a guy who had a dispute about it and he sent me a thing calling me a stupid wet bag and so I showed my dad I was like, Look dad I made it. <laughs> 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 that is so funny. Yeah. 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 Oh, but yeah, you, like you were saying, uh, when I was growing up and I was watching like Telemundo or Univision, I don't know if you guys remember that commercial with the Capitana Echeverria. 
Yeah. Where Nicaragua, Salvador, Honduras, and you know, like he would. And then I'm like, what part of Mexico is he from? And where are all these places in Mexico? Like it didn't click that other countries right. spoke Spanish. Like right. it didn't click. Like for the longest time, I felt like Honduras was somewhere in Mexico. Like it was right. weird. I That's why. Right. Right. I'm sorry. When is the only place you got to see the other way. Right. Oh, there it is. Yeah. But then you go to Mexico City, you know, the definitely, man, you get people, you know, you get everybody, you know, from Africa. To, to blonde blood. Look at Fetty Aldama. Right when I first time I heard his name and I was on you know, the internet, I go, oh, I gotta meet this professor, you know. And I see this like white looking dude coming and I go, oh, who's this guy? You know, and, you know like, he went to you. <laughs> yeah. so that's, that's why I also said it was colonial ignorance though, because we have that lack of information because we are made to have that lack of information. We learn about European history all the time. Yes. We don't learn about South American history. There's a lot of American involved yes. history in South America, but we don't know nothing about that. Right. Exactly. And that, and that goes towards what I said. So I have to add to it. No, but it's absolutely true. You're totally right. Cause I, like I teach history too, and I'm always talking about this stuff, and I get to it like, what? And I'm like, yeah. Like, like you come from a really amazing place. Like, yeah. it's like, you should learn from it. You know, it's, right. it's so sad that like the schools don't teach us or have that curriculum. We're starting to turn though. There's all the yeah, ethnic studies classes yeah. are coming up around uh, required. Prerequisite. Yeah, yeah. I forgot the time, but you couldn't even speak. I went to a Catholic school for two years. You couldn't speak Spanish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Speaking yeah, by the way, I was Jaime Carlos. I can't remember. But anyway, I was James. Oh. Carl. Anna got to keep her name. I don't know why, but she got to keep her name. I don't know. There was all the place. Well, no, no, it was boys and girls, but I was just saying it's like there was a few of us in. But yeah. You couldn't speak Spanish, you weren't, you know, it was, that's just the way it was. Wow. Yeah, and I'm getting old, but not that old, you know, with an act for it. So, like, so moral. Yeah. <laughs> when I started doing comics in the 1800s, you know. <laughs> I remember even recently, um, Sephora, they, they ended up getting a lawsuit against them because they were not in their work to speak Spanish on the floor. Really? Whoa. Yeah, that was within the last 10 years that happened, wow. I want to say. So it's like that that's still perver- you know, pervasive into our culture. Yeah, and you hear like some people complaining about Spanish speaking Mexicans at their Chinese restaurant and like, guess you cook your food here too. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> right. Right. No, it's it's true. I mean I even had a guy that's married in our family, he's from Mexico. He didn't even really speak Spanish. He was like the guy pss, pss, you gotta you know, aquí, then I got pss, pss, pss. There's a lot of that's like like <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, he had all the little sound effects and hand movements. Uh-huh. And so it was interesting. Part, part yeah. of yeah, well, I'm glad that the school system is changing their curriculum well, now. Uh, I don't know how smoothly it's going to go, but they had some plan. Well, well, loops on. Loops on. In I'm 2009, on. I was working at a charter school where it was the first time that I had seen the school systems actually address Christopher Columbus in a different way. And you know how the board is supposed to be where you see all the, the beautiful work that the kids have done, so you want to showcase this. The kids were talking about how Christopher Columbus was a villain. One of the papers said, I don't know why we celebrate Christopher Columbus. He was a bad guy. Blah, 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 blah. And I was like, whoa. Yeah. 2009. Yeah. So I'm like, this is very different. And that's yeah. when I started seeing people start talking about we want people on Indigenous Day. We want to stop with Columbus Day and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, well, there's even, there's even weird things happening. But in other words, there's this, like, and it's good that we're starting to recover indigeneity, but it's also coming to this place, too, where, like, are we still rising mestizaje? Are we still looking? things that have made it made the culture interesting, how much, you know, I know there's a lot going on, there's a lot of places, you know, a lot of balls in the air, and you like the discussion, although the club is one, it's an easy one, you know? yeah, yeah. No, for sure, <laughs> but I think, well, I always, I always tell the kids too, like the old rhyme was, you know, 1492, club has sailed the ocean blue, right, 1493, club has stole all we could see, oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> I mean, it's all about, like, just giving people the right information. Yeah. 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 And, and, and this goes back to the stories about autobiographical work. You're giving the people the right information, and you're able to do it in a way that makes it entertaining. That's what does it the best. You know, that's why I give Gear a reason to smile to be more of a cartoony look versus a traditional comic book look, because I want it to be received that way. You know, it's very purposeful. So you know, if we, if we're going to push for any kind of story to be prevalent, we have to try to make it in an in a entertaining way. And I think the Chinese have done it the best when they did Fon Sayuk, and they did uh, you know some of the some of their um, historical figures. They did them in a way that they almost appear like superheroes. 
they're jumping off the buildings and they're jumping you know, over 10, 20 people and they're jumping on everybody's heads and stuff like that. Um, they're doing things that superheroes do, but these are actual people that are in the history of Chapman. So if we can make something that's entertaining, something that is um, far reaching in a way that it's gonna to touch everybody, not just one group or one part of the society, that's gonna make it a mainstream idea, that's gonna make it um, digestible, and then it's gonna make it normalized. And I think that's where, where, if we can go in that direction, that'll bring our stories to a higher level, and still be able to do the ones that we just want to do. Because that's the balance. You gotta be able to do stuff that's digestible for everybody, and then still find a way to do the stuff that's gonna make you happy and you know, feed your soul. Yeah. So have my fourth cutting book, Sabata and Iron Man Armor. Yes. <laughs> <I love it. laughs> yeah, that's one of the things I learned in doing this podcast is a lot of the stories of the stuff that I wanted to learn from uh, came from independent creators writing stories and then um, highlighting some reference in history that made us look in and research what the story was about and we learned so much about ourselves in doing that and Unfortunately, like when I went to school, they weren't teaching that, but because of independent writers, uh, independent creators that that are passionate about this, uh, we also learn, and we also get inspired to learn more. Um, so just to end our panel, um, would you guys like to share your social media pages? How can people contact you? Where can people buy your work? So you can absolutely get it from my table today. It's the cheapest, easiest way to do so. Um, but if you are not able to today, which is absolutely understandable, you can go to thecurve.com. Uh, curve has no E, so the T-H-E-C-U-R-V.com. It has all of my stuff. And then thecurve.com slash books has A Reason to Smile and the books that I've done there. And I'm on Instagram all the time showing how I make the work that I work, that I make. Uh, so you see the sketches, you see the process, and that's the learning curve with no E at the end. So the learning C-U-R-V, and then someone took that on Twitter, so I had to put T-H-A so on the learning curve. Yeah, man. Most of my stuff's in any local liquor store or taqueria. <laughs> no, seriously, no. Um, yeah. Just as Javier said, you can go to my table. I'll be the, the, the bald guy there. Yeah. yeah, the shady guy at the table there. Yeah, yeah I got some power tools too. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, you can come there. I got all my stuff there. Uh, social media, let's see. I'm on uh, Instagram, and it's, I guess it's a little at the, uh, at the, uh, what's the underscore? Underscore. 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 Thank you. Uh, you tell the whole guy, why does it same work? Why is it smoking? You know? um, so yeah, it's the under, underscore uh, comics vato, C-O-M-I-X-V-A-T-O. Oh no, it's, no, it's, it's, you see, it's the underscore real, R-E-A-L, because I got hacked. <laughs> underscore comics about those c-o-m-i-x-b-a-t-o that's on instagram i have a, a, a i'm on jaime crespo i'm on uh, what is it facebook yeah. and i have a website which is uh corn tortilla press.com corn tortilla press.com the best title ever <laughs> corn tortilla <laughs> so, press Love yeah it. it was either gonna be that or fry bread too but fry bread was taken so i did the corn tortilla and but a blog too Oh, my vlog, which occasionally, that's right, thanks, Dave. Uh, uh, the, um, that's uh, Pazvato, P-A-Z-V-A-T-O, on, on you, YouTube. Thank you. It's on YouTube. Every now and then I do a vlog. Yeah, though YouTube. You know, you kids, you know, I've got to hitch up my pants while I say that. I don't YouTube. Though YouTube. Yeah, so I'm on that. There you go. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Ruben Loves Comics. I you know post about a lot of oh, stuff yeah. and stuff too. Um, and then I have a website. It's ironcladpress.com, and there I have a lot of free stuff, including my. I got a web comic about Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, I got a my comic made about my grandma Abuelita. A couple others on there. They're free. Excellent. And my table's over there too, but not where it's Well, thank you guys for joining us here on this panel. I'd like for you guys to join me in a clapping for... Um
as a thank you to our panelists on being here today. Thank you guys so much. Enjoy the convention. Thank you. Oh.